So greetings, uh, my name is Rafael Ruiz from New, um, New York Kinokuniya Bookstore. Today we are speaking with best-selling author, Alexandra Bracken. Hello. Alexandra Bracken is the number one New York Times best-selling author of the Darkest Minds series and Passenger series. Born and raised in Arizona, she moved east to study history and English at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. She sold her first book when she was still a senior there. After working in publishing for several years, she now writes full time. Her work is available across the world in over 15 languages and has been adapted for the big screen. Yes. That's a very impressive <laughs> bio there. I was, I've been busy the last 10 or so years, so <laughs> thank you. So um, your latest book, Lore, which has been out for a little over a month now? Yeah, it came out uh, January 5th in the United mm -hmm. States. So can you describe a little bit about the premise um, and oh, just yeah. the setting of okay. lore and just how we do yeah? It's like a little bit of an involved premise, but I will give you <laughs> the full pitch. Um, so lore is centered on, I also feel like I just have lore lurking over <laughs> my shoulder. <laughs> I don't know why I'm blocking it. It's like out. double. Um, lore is centered on 17 year old lore. She lives in modern day New York City. So this is contemporary fantasy. Um, but she was born and raised in this kind of like secret cult-like Spartan-esque society of hunters. And every seven years for seven days, these hunters participate in a special hunt in which nine of the Greek gods are their prey. So as punishment for trying to betray Zeus and trying to betray his wishes, mm -hmm. they are cursed to walk the earth as mortal during this week. And if one of the hunters can kill a god, they can take that god's power and immortality. But the big catch of that is that seven years later, they themselves mm -hmm. become one of the hunted as a new god. And so Laura has left this world behind after her family was killed at the end of the last hunt. And she wants nothing more to do with it, nothing more to do with its violence and its darkness, except the hunts, of course, mm -hmm. and destiny are not done with her. <laughs> and <laughs> the hunt is back in New York City this year and a wounded Athena shows up on her doorstep seeking help, but also offering Laura the one thing Laura's always wanted, which is vengeance for mm -hmm. her murdered family. So that's pretty much the setup of the story, mm -hmm. but I describe it as being like very action-packed and twisty. Um, it's sort of like a little bit my ode to the movie mm -hmm. The Highlander. I don't know if you've ever uh, seen it, but like I love that movie so much growing up that I was like, how can I write a story like The Highlander, but like make it my own completely? So... <laughs> It really, it was so much fun to write, and I especially loved writing all of the gods in this modern city and modern setting and having mm -hmm. that fish out of water element. That's great. So you already mentioned um, like the wounded Athena and some of the characters. So can you describe, obviously without spoilers, but some of the other characters we're going to encounter in reading yeah. lore? Yeah, so Athena is actually one of the main characters of the book. She was a delight to write, both because <laughs> she has these like amazing one-liners that you would expect yes. from a god of some kind, an ancient being, but also um, she really, it was so interesting to write her and the other gods in this book because they are not human, but they seem to have these like heightened human emotions. And so it was really kind of fun to play with that dynamic. But we also have um, Miles, who is Lore's best friend. They're roommates right now in the city, and Miles has no idea that Lore essentially grew up in a murder cult. So he kind of gets that unhappy surprise when he's introduced to Athena when they're coming home one morning. Um, another character is Castor, who is Lore's best friend and training partner when they were um, training together in this secret society. But Lore, due to kind of a misunderstanding, thinks Castor has died as well. And so she also, again, gets another shock when she sees him and realizes that he is still, in fact, alive and maybe some sparks fly. Um, and then Van is another main character. He's sort of the spy type. He is um, a cousin of Castor, and he and Lore kind of clash in interesting and fun ways. So I think that's like the main main right. cast, but there are lots of other supporting characters. It's like a big cast of characters, a lot of action in this one. <laughs> So this might be oversimplistic, but what do you hope readers will gain from Laura? Oh, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, Miles actually gives the theme of the book pretty early on um, in the story when he tells Laura that she has to 
come to terms essentially with her past. She has to confront this past that she's faced. He doesn't know at the time that it's actually like quite a like traumatic dark past, but he can sense that she has some like unresolved trauma in her past. And he tells her essentially that you need to kind of confront and process what's happened to you if you ever want to seize the future that you want, if you want that like happier, brighter tomorrow that you're longing for. And I think that's really um, the message of the book is that the human spirit is unconquerable and that mm -hmm. we have strength within us that sometimes we doubt, but is there and is waiting to be harnessed. Mm -hmm. That's actually beautiful. I definitely felt that. Uh, reading oh, the book myself yeah. <laughs> that's great um <laughs> so your book is based in new york city um our store yeah. is located in new york city and i know you've been here before uh, why new york city as opposed to anywhere in the world oh that's a good question too so i lived in new york city after i graduated oh. college i actually worked on the other side of the publishing industry as i was publishing my book so like my writing career was really my evening gig Okay. Um, in my weekend gig, I wrote the entire Darkest Mind series pretty much exclusively on weekends. Oh. Um, and I loved living in the city. I found it very challenging as an introvert. It's, mm -hmm. there's no, it's almost indescribable because there's really no place else that's like it. And that kind of captures the energy in the barely controlled chaos of the city at times. And I was feeling kind of homesick for New York mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Arizona, I'm back where oh. I grew up and it feels, you know, feels very quiet and calm compared to New York. And I was really missing it. And I was actually hoping to take a couple of research trips last year oh. to kind of like, you know, take photos of areas that are mentioned in the book. Um, and also to just like double check myself on a couple mm -hmm. of things. And unfortunately the pandemic kind of right. ruled that out, but I, it was really nice to even just visit New York City again mm -hmm. in my imagination. Is that something you still hope to do? Like come to New York and almost yeah, do like a, a tour of other places the book went? <laughs> yeah, I would love to give a lore tour of New York because <laughs> there are a couple of um, places in the book that obviously exist. Um, but there are a couple that are like based on locations that exist. Mm -hmm. I'm like trying to describe this without spoiling it. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, I, would, I really am kind of sad. I didn't get to go and take mm -hmm. photos and kind of walk readers through where she lives on the Upper West Side, right. way up in Harlem and all of that too, so. And it was fun Someday. reading, yeah. It was fun reading the book and there's a part where they're near Bryan Park and the store yeah. is near Bryan Park. So it's like, oh, I know where that is, so it was fun. <laughs> you know what, actually you just reminded me that in an earlier version of the book, there was like an even bigger scene that was set in Bryan Park. <laughs> and I ended up like trimming it out and combining it with another scene, but I like, now I, now I feel sad. That didn't make <laughs> the final book. Got sacrificed to pacing. That makes sense. I wanted to ask, since you mentioned uh, when you were working in publishing, as you were writing kind of on the, like on the weekends or the side gig, how, how did you manage to do that? I know there's a lot of people who are aspiring writers mm -hmm. too, but also have that juggling between nine to five jobs versus doing yeah. that. Have you any advice for them or how to continue that? I... My advice is always to be like very forgiving with yourself. Mm. When, it, when you have a full-time job, a lot of the times, you know, you, you work a full day and then you have the commute and that just drains a lot of your mental energy and a lot of your creativity out of you. I was lucky in that I worked in publishing. So I was like constantly thinking about books and storytelling. Oh. Um, and so it was kind of easy to transfer that energy into writing on the weekends. And I feel like, the biggest thing you can do if you have a day job right now and you want to eventually be published or you want to try to finish that book you've been working on for years is to really just like set, you know, like make a date with yourself and your mm -hmm. laptop or your computer or your notebook and really keep to it. Don't let anything else interrupt you. Um, you know, don't let your friends tempt you to do this or that. Obviously, I feel like it's a, in some ways it's easier and harder right now during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, because we're being pulled so many ways, even as we're kind of forced to stay in one place and we have so much anxiety and, you know, uncertainty still bearing down on us. Mm -hmm. And I also greatly benefited from, you know, being a single person, not having any children, basically only needing to take care of myself. And my schedule really reflected that. Um, it sounds almost like a little, 
And I like, don't want to romanticize my, right, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't want to romanticize it too much. Um, I like missed the energy and the excitement and the passion that I had when I was writing frantically on the weekends, but I was absolutely keeping mole person hours where it was like, uh-huh. I would come home on Friday, get my Chipotle, get like three <laughs> bottles of Mountain Dew and just work from, um, you know, <laughs> My dog is making himself known. <laughs> come here. You want to come here? He's guarding the door. Um, <laughs> I'd work from like 7 p.m. to 4 o'clock in the morning, go to bed, work all day Saturday till 4 o'clock in the morning. So I was keeping like really out. I was keeping hours that like were not sustainable and contributed to burnout down the line. But it really, I think when you want it badly enough, you figure out how to make it work, but it is especially very mm-hmm. challenging right now. So everybody, please right. be gentle with yourselves. So on the writer aspect, I know broadly speaking, we have the, the pantsers and the plotters, people mm-hmm. who outline everything and the people who kind of discover as they go along. Where do you say you would fit on that spectrum? Do you, did you have, like, especially for lore, did you have a lot of it already set in your mind or did it like develop as you were diving oh, in? Oh man, lore was like, this book almost broke my spirit in the editorial <laughs> process. I loved it so much. And thankfully I loved it enough that it like sustained me through <laughs> the experience. But um, usually I, I'm like a little bit of a mix between mm-hmm. pantsing and plotting. Um, I'm more of a plotter now than I was. Mm-hmm. And I, than I used to be, especially when I was writing the Darkest Mind series. And I figure, you know, now that I, I feel like I have a better understanding of craft, so inevitably I plot a little bit more up front. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing that keeps people from finishing books is that they don't know the major turning points as they're going in. They kind of want the fun of experiencing that journey, but it doesn't always create for the most streamlined plots. Mm-hmm. And so really the first thing you should know when you start a book is how the book is going to end and wh- who the character is at the very end of the book. But with lore, I have like a really, um, weirdly enough, I've never had this happen before, but I thought of the twist in lore, like the, I would say it's the bi- the biggest twist in the book. There are lots of little baby twists um, that comes, well, I don't want to, I don't want to tip right. anybody off. Um, I thought of the twist, the really brutal twist um, first, and, and then I had to kind of like build the story and the characters around this twist that I love the idea of so much. And that ended up creating like a very complex, um, very complex, very time consuming edit in the end, because that was not usually how I plotted. So it was, it was a little bit of a mess, but we got there in the end. So in in the past, you've worked with time travel in your Mm -hmm. novels and you you described those as being very tricky to write about. And in lore, obviously you tackled Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Um, Are they equally as tricky or is, is one was harder to write than the other or is it just two different beasts? I think two totally different beasts. Time travel is just complex because there's the science side of it where you're having to like figure out, (laughs) it's almost like a logic riddle and that is not how my brain works. My brain is like, I will take the most, you know, like, I, I don't know, my brain just like never can directly logically solve a problem. It has to really meander through all of the different options then it creates like a narrative and it's great for storytelling, terrible for, you know, like taking the LSAT or being a lawyer or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I just, time travel really was tough for me because of that, because you have to be so on top of the rules and you have to constantly be checking to make sure you're not breaking your own rules and causing like disturbances. And ugh. anyway, I love time travel. I love reading it. I love watching it, love writing it a little bit less. But with this, you know, there's a lot more flexibility because there are so many different versions of the Greek myths. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I could kind of choose which version I wanted to use and adapt it to suit my needs a little bit more. So there was some flexibility there. Um, But really, there are obviously rules of the hunt that had to be established. There's like a lot of backstory that has to come into play over the course of the book. So there are many moving parts to this book too. But I would say on the whole, it's a, it was a little bit easier mm-hmm. to, you know, actually write than time travel. So for the Greek mythology aspect, how much research um, were you doing before actually getting started on it? Like how much research did that take? Or Yeah, I don't know about you. I was totally the Greek mythology nerd kid. <laughs> I was not like a horse girl or anything. I was, I was not reading Babysitter's Club. I was reading like Greek myths. 
Um, and that was partly because my mom's side of the family is Greek. So oh, okay. um, as like a way to kind of start talking about that side of our heritage, she gave us Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. I have it on the counter, but I think I finally put it away. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like a beautifully illustrated you know, version of these myths. And that was really my gateway <laughs> to learning more about them and reading about them and loving these stories. But like, you know, from a young age, you can see how problematic a lot of them are and how dark and twisted a lot of these stories are. And um, so I didn't end up having to do a ton of research on the mm -hmm. mythological side, except for kind of fact checking, fact checking myself. But I did a lot of research into um, actual like ancient Greek societies, especially Spartan culture and trying to figure out how I could take pieces of these societies and adapt it to this like very oppressive hidden world of hunters within our world and figure out like what are the rituals that they would still try to practice and what are the beliefs that they would still wholeheartedly believe in and try to champion and further. So that was really interesting and I really enjoyed that research. But yeah, that was probably the most research intensive part of the book. So my knowledge of Greek mythology is, is very limited. <laughs> but I, as I understand, like, so they're definitely like figures like Athena, um, the like, goddess figures, but in the overall it doesn't seem like Greek mythology has female heroes. And, no. obviously, and obviously in lore, there were very strong female protagonists. So how important was that for you to have a strong female role in it lore? It's very important. There's really only like one instance of like a heroine, but even, but even then it's really, you know, women fundamentally had a different way of gaining honor and glory. Um, and the thing that always really bothered me as, even as a kid reading these stories was that, you know, women didn't get to go on these big adventures. They were often sort of like casualties of these big adventures that the heroes went on. They were left behind, they were mistreated, they um, would help the hero in some way, but then, you know, <laughs> they themselves were, did not get the actual glory of that, um, of that great triumph. And so for me, and on top of all of that too, you have so many instances of sexual violence and you see a lot of women being punished in these stories for showing like very human emotions like anger and ambition and, you know, basically trying to step out of the norms of what was expected for them. And so it was really important to me to have a hero like Lore who would be able to kind of step in and play the part of breaking down that culture and those, you know, to really confront a lot of those problematic aspects head on. Mm -hmm. I think that's also a good analogy to what's happening now, I guess like yeah. in the publishing industry with more and more people are, are looking at diversity and inclusion in books, whereas before breaking the norms was something yeah. you just don't do. So definitely yeah. seems to come right out of that. And it's interesting too, because um, I was really brainstorming this book when Me Too was mm -hmm. finally starting to kind of rise up and we were discussing it more as a society. We were having bigger conversations around sexual violence and about, you know, how people who identify as women are forced to navigate through the world. And one of the reasons why I decided to have Lore descended from Perseus was because one of the more controversial myths, I would say, is the story of Medusa, who appears on the cover. That's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. we have her on the cover. Um, in terms of sexual violence, she was assaulted in the Temple of Athena by Poseidon, and there are different versions of this myth, um, but the common one is really that after she was raped by Poseidon, Athena punishes her by turning her into, you know, this hideous creature who can turn men to stone with a single look, and she's just fearsome and um, frightening, and Medusa is still used kind of, she's still, the image is still kind of weaponized against women, especially mm -hmm. women seeking power or who have ambition and all of that. Um, but it was really interesting to tackle this story from a more feminist point of view um, mm -hmm. and to kind of bring in some of the more feminist interpretations of Medusa's story. 
It's brilliant. And with that cover in mind, so did you have actual say in the cover design or? Yeah, you know, we talked a lot about the cover. Um, my idea was something a little bit different, but it was yeah. related to this, which mm -hmm. is having, um, you know, a scene depicted in, to carve stone that showed more modern characters and like mm. this crazy battle happening around. And we saw this statue of Medusa and the designer just had this absolute brainwave about what this cover could be and how to balance the fact that it is using ancient stories and ancient beings, but it is a modern person and it is a living person. And I think, you know, ultimately having that one like human eye peeking out is that like perfectly somehow encapsulates the story. So I'm thrilled with it. I did get a say, but I cannot take credit for it at all. <laughs> I mean, the cover is beautiful. I have a I have a pin that's on my bag all the time now since I got it. So yeah, I'm always seeing it. It's a beautiful. Of, <laughs> it has a lot of fun art in it too. We did a map of New York City for the people who might not be familiar with it. There's, if you're not familiar with Greek mythology, have no fear. Um, we have some, we have the list of the hunter families and at the very back of the book, there is a cast of characters list, yes. including the gods. So you can kind of like, you know, flip back and forth if you find yourself being like, what's the difference between Athena and Artemis? <laughs> right. So is Lord uh, gonna be a standalone or do you plan it on going is. back into like, the- I'm kind of proud of the fact that okay. it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad too, because it's, um, um, you know, I had so much fun with the characters and I like the, I mean, I, it's hard to say I like the world that Lore inhabits because it's very problematic and very punishing um, and cruel to her and to many of the people she loves. But um, I enjoyed just, I enjoyed writing her so much that I'm almost sad that that's, you know, where we mm. part, but I'm very satisfied with where the book ends. So to go to some of your other works, I know The Darkest Minds was made into a movie. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any hopes of lore being made into a movie as well? Or oh, do you have I any would... visions of who you would want to be in that? Or That's a good question. I would love that. Um, <laughs> I think it would actually make for a great movie and not just because I love the Highlander. <laughs> no, I, I think, think definitely you know, would. Yeah. It's, it's set o the book is set over a week. So I think that kind of like creates a nice, um, uh, what's the word? Um, that I'm looking for here, a nice crucible. I think that's what mm -hmm. Dan Brown calls it, like that ticking clock that the right, character yeah. is thrown into. Um, and I think there are so many larger than life personalities in here, especially, you know, the gods themselves. I honestly have no idea who I would cast in a mm -hmm. film version of this. I feel like Athena would have to be someone almost like Charlize Theron um that just has that like stature and that like uh -huh. presence that is like and I love Charlize that's like a little bit reserved <laughs> and kind of like commanding I think I don't know who I'm like trying to figure out who I would actually love to see in a film adaptation but I can't think of anybody off the top of my head it's hard because I obviously right. have such a clear vision of the characters in my head and nobody really matches right that. how so I, mean, so I guess when you write, you obviously have a clear view of the characters in your head. So when you had your characters in the Darkest Mind series and then you saw the film adaptation, um, did you like the adaptation? Did, or was it very different? Like, did it match your vision? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> There were certain moments in that film where I was like, wow, you like, it's like you had a front row seat to my brain. <laughs> um, but you know, the one, it was such an interesting experience to go through. I think the film and the book are ultimately ended up even though they have, they share a plot, they ultimately feel so different to me that they mm -hmm. feel like separate entities. So I was able to kind of enjoy the film for what the film is rather than like constantly comparing uh -huh. it with the book and getting to meet the cast and getting to meet the crew who worked on it. It was like, it was so wonderful to have this story that was just mine for the longest time become almost like, this collaboration between a bunch of really wonderful people and to see their vision of the characters in the world. So I enjoyed it. I <laughs> love the main cast. Those actors are just wonderful. Um, but yeah, it is very different from the book. Ultimately. <laughs> even if it basically follows the plot, it is, I would say, pretty different, even in tone. Well, yeah, so you're, and um, I checked this morning, but so Laura is still on the New York Times bestsellers list. Is yeah. that something that 
really surprises you or were at this point are you like oh of course I expected it <laughs> no I never take it for granted I think I've had as many books hit the list as not hit the list and that's like a very healthy state <laughs> to have it as an author in terms of just keep the balance how you feel about it it's so wonderful when it happens and I'm like absolutely delighted that this book has worked so well for readers I kind of had a sense that it might do well just because I knew how many people out there also love Greek mythology and there hadn't, I think because Percy Jackson is so, it just is so mm -hmm. dominant in our, in the kid lit YA sphere um, that no one, we've had like the occasional um, Greek myth at, um, Greek myth retelling and really interesting um, takes on Greek mythology, like the lovely war. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, I, I feel like people are hungry for like a slightly different take on Greek mythology that still feels kind of action packed and twisty, but it definitely has done so far and away so much better than even I had hoped. So I'm really grateful for that. I mean, like for as a bookstore, um, it was out of print for a little bit and it just went to reprint. So oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, we, yeah, were, we wouldn't have copies for a bit. So this is great to hear. <laughs> I know. I was like, wow. We had um, uh, Barnes and Noble picked it as their YA book club pick for January, that, yeah. which was huge. It was, I was like freaking out about it. Um, and that really, I think helped spread the word, but it's also because of the pandemic and printers mm -hmm. and delays, right. it's also been kind of a bummer that it's been out of, basically it's been out <laughs> of stock for a full month. It's a good problem to have, but I'm like, yeah, it should be finally, um, I think I heard it's, it's going to be in this week to the warehouse. So thankfully another reprint is on the way. <laughs> so um, if you can tell us, do you have any future projects that you're working on or anything coming yeah. up? Okay. Well, I have, Lore came out on January 5th. And then yeah. on January 2nd, I had Brightly Woven, the graphic novel come out. This is a really sweet um, young reader graphic novel um, adaptation that's the word I was looking for there. <laughs> What's that word? It's a graphic novel adaptation of my debut novel I sold while I was still oh. in college. And the novel itself is not out of print because the publisher shut its doors, sadly. And mm. I had the idea that this, it would make for like a really cute graphic novel, really bright and just like fun, oh. sweeping graphic novel for younger readers. So that is now out in stores. Um, and then I just sold another project. This Ooh. one uses, it's YA again, and it uses kind of Celtic and Arthurian lore. And I'm really excited to finally be able to announce it. But it's it it's like lore in that it does, it's not like a straightforward retelling of a story, but it mm -hmm. uses that lore and that um, those legends in a way that I think will hopefully feel fresh. And it's also contemporary fantasy. So hopefully That's... I'll be able to talk about it a little <laughs> bit more soon. That sounds amazing. I want to say thank you very much, Alexander, for um, your time. Again. So happy. And we look so much forward to future works and everything else. Thank you. I'm like so looking forward to visiting you guys at the store yes, when please. things get back to normal again. I can't mm -hmm. believe it's been so long since Passenger came out, but yeah, I need yeah. another visit. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but just for so people know, um, Laura's out now and our store does have signed copies while supplies yeah. last. <laughs> um, of course um, and yeah thank you so much for spending time we definitely look forward to seeing you in store thank you I really appreciate it